All right, welcome everyone to another Theory Lunch. Today we are very happy to have Ryu, Ryu Heimori, if I'm yes. good, job, good job pronouncing that, from the Tokyo Institute of Technology. This will actually be the first of two straight talks we'll be having on things related to quantum computing. So if you're interested in this one, you should come back next week. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Ryu Heimori from Tokyo Institute of Technology. I'm visiting CMU from January 10th to the end of March for discussing with Professor Ryan Ordner on analysis of Boolean function. <coughs> in fact, this work is strongly related to analysis of Boolean function. Uh, subject is connection between quantum physics and computer science. Maybe some of you are working on quantum computation or quantum information processing. Usually, first, we know mathematics of quantum physics. Then we can argue that which quantum information is possible or not possible. But in this area, we consider in opposite way. First, we argue which information processing should be possible or should not be possible. Then we characterize quantum physics. Uh, quantum physics has a beautiful mathematical representation, so it is completely fine, no problem, no one doubt quantum physics. But we do not have any explanation for the quantum physics. Usually, in quantum physics, first, we start from Hilbert space, and pure state is an element of Hilbert space, and mixed state is an Hermitian operator on Hilbert space. It is completely mathematics, and there is no explanation. So we want to find postulates of quantum physics. They are similar to axiom in math, but it has meaning. So we cannot uh, check whether or not pure state is represented by, represented by uh, element of Hilbert space directly. But so postulate is something like following information cannot be transmitted faster than light or communication complexity is not always equal to one. So uh, our goal is to find the postulate for quantum physics. So maybe some of you are not familiar with quantum physics. It is okay, no problem. First, let me remark uh, two points. Uh, there is no concept of quantum probability. Probability is always a tuple of non-negative values with some one, no exception. But what is new is two concepts, state and measurement. State is something like environment, and measurement is operation to state. And if we perform measurement to state, then we obtain outcome. And this outcome obeys some probability distribution. And this probability distribution is uh, determined both by state and measurement. This is all of what we should know on quantum physics here. OK, so let's consider this game, CHSH game. This is a very simple game. And in this game, we can distinguish uh, classical physics and quantum physics. There are three persons, referee, Alice, and Bob. Referee give X and Y to Alice and Bob, respectively. Both are bits. And Alice and Bob answer A and B. Both are bits. Then they win if and only if A plus B is equal to X and Y. In quantum settings, they can use shared quantum state. But first, let's consider classical case. They can use shared random bits. So what is our, and assume that X and Y are given uniformly. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 are given with probability one quarter. What is the largest winning probability of this game? Yes, three quarters. So, because uh, if X and Y are uniform, right hand side is one with probability one quarter. So, if both of A and B are zero, they win with probability three quarters. And in fact, this is maximum. <coughs> uh, this is a proof. Uh, even if they use shared random bits, it doesn't help to increase winning probability because the winning probability is convex combination of winning probability for each case. So without loss of generality, we can assume that 
Alice determines A only by X, deterministically. So A0 is A when X equals to zero, and B0 is B when Y equals to zero, and A1 is A when X equals to one, and B1 is B when Y equals to one. And here we assume that they are plus one or minus one, not zero one. Then product corresponds to XOR, and this divided by four is average point they get. That means we assume that they get one point if they win, and they lose one point if they lose. Then this divided by four is average point they get. Here they win if and only if XOR is zero, so that means product is one. And only this case, X and Y equal to one, in this case, they win if XOR is one. So that means this product is minus one. So negative sign is here. And then we obtain this equation. And here is one of B0 plus B1 or B0 minus B1 is zero because they are plus one or minus one. And the another must be plus two or minus two. And coefficient A0, A1 are plus one or minus one. So this is always plus two or minus two. So upper bounded by two. Two means in these four terms, three terms are one and one term is minus one. So that corresponds to three quarters. And this is maximum winning probability in classical case. But in quantum case, the winning probability is strictly larger. It's 0 0.854. Can you explain the game again? I, I didn't understand it. Okay. X and Y are given according to uni uniform distribution. Are they one bit each? Yes, it is one bit. Okay. And Alice and Bob answer A and B, and they, they cannot communicate. Without communication, Alice output A and Bob output B. And they win if and only if A plus B plus is XOR equal to X and Y. A and B are zero and one here, right? Yes. And plus and minus one on the next slide. Ah, yes, in the proof. In the proof, uh, I use plus and minus. So is, is, the, is the randomness in the choice of A and B or the randomness in the generated by the referee? Yes, randomness comes from the distribution of X and Y, and also they can use shared random bits. But, but in fact, it doesn't help to increase winning probability, so. So their goal, Bob and Alice, their goal is to obtain that, that equation. Yes. Yes. In classical case, this holds with probability at most three quarters. But quantum case, that means Alice and Bob can use shared quantum state, then the maximum probability is 0 0.854. So A and B have the output is <coughs> some function of X? Uh, yeah, y. Uh, classical case, it's true, but quantum case, they can measure state. And this measurement is determined from X and Y, and Measurement gives outcome, and depending on, on this outcome, Alice and Bob can uh, determine A and B. Yeah. So intuitively, this is strange, but uh, this is uh, this happens in quantum physics. <laughs> and in the following, yeah, if always choose, if they both always choose one, then. A and B. The XOR will be zero, and the probability will be three quarters. Oh, I see. That's yes, the three quarters. Yes, solution. yes, okay. yes. Okay. In the following, we will see that in general theory, general theory allows larger CHSH winning probability. So this fact gives natural question why quantum physics allows this, but does not allow winning probability larger than, larger than 0 0.854. This is natural question. Okay, let's consider general setting, general theory. So let's forget quantum physics. And the situation is same, but there is no rule. And we consider distribution of A and B when X and Y are given. We can regard this as vector of length 16 because there are four bits here. So there are 16 values. So we can regard this as vector of length 16. Of course, essential dimension is smaller because this is probability distribution, so it must be normalized. Anyway, then we can consider a set of 
these vectors uh, arrowed in quantum physics and arrowed in classical physics. And former is strictly larger than a latter. It was shown in the CHSH game example. So in the following, what is the requirement for this distribution? The no signaling condition is very weak condition. This simply means marginal distribution of A cannot depend on Y. This is a very simple condition. Left-hand side is marginal distribution of A when Y equals zero, and right-hand side is marginal distribution of A when Y equals one. They are same. If this is violated, A includes in information on Y. This means Alice obtain information on Y. So that is communication. So only, only by measuring state, Bob can send information to Alice. This, is, this should be forbidden because this communication is uh, in instant. It is, the speed is infinity faster than light, so it must be uh, forbidden. So this is a very weak condition. So of course, quantum physics satisfies this condition, and even if we imagine, we consider a general theory, this condition must be satisfied. So they are linear equations, so this decreases uh, dimension of linear space. Let's count uh, linearly independent <coughs> constraints. Four from normalization constraints and four from no signaling condition. So there are eight linearly independent conditions. So essential dimension is 16 minus eight, eight dimensional linear space. And <coughs> we have inequality conditions on probabilities. Of course, they must be non-negative. This defines some polytope called no signaling polytope. Okay, next we, we consider a set of conditional distributions realized by classical physics. This polytope is defined by vert vertices rather than facets. Each vertex corresponds to deterministic choice of Alice and Bob. Alice uh, choose A from X and Bob choose B from Y, deterministically. So number of cases is 16. So this is a function from one bit to one bit. There are four functions. So four by four is 16. And take convex hull of 16 vertices. It is local polytope. And, and this is local polytope. This is eight dimensional space and no signal polytope has 16 facets and local polytope has 16 vertices. What is facet of local polytope? There are two types of facets. First one is a uh, trivial facet from non-negativity of probabilities. Second type of facet is the CHSH inequality. There are eight uh, equivalent facets, and this top left one divided by four means the winning probability of CHSH game is at most three quarters. And this is in fact facet of local polytope. <coughs> In other words, <coughs> if conditional distribution satisfy all of these HSH inequalities, then such conditional distribution can be generated in classical physics. Yes, this was shown in 1981, 1982. So then, on the other hand, in non-signaling polytope, CHSH probability one is allowed. This is a unique example, unique element. Here, support of this distribution satisfy the condition of, winning condition of CHSH game. A plus B is equal to X and Y. And this satisfy, uh, marginal distributions are always uniform. So this satisfy no signaling condition. So this means no signaling condition admits CHSH probability one. So naturally, we can consider the, this question uh, this is a summary. Uh, in no signal condition, CHSH probability is equal to one. And for in quantum physics, largest <coughs> CHSH probability is 0 0.854. And in classical physics, it is at most 0 0.75. And in fact, it's facet for local polytope. And question is, why does quantum physics prohibit CHSH probability greater than 0 0.854? This is a question. <coughs> More challenging problem is characterization of this set 
eight dimensional set, but this is challenging. So first, so in the following, we only consider this one dimensional value, CHSH probability. Okay. So I want to introduce uh, these three results and also my result briefly. First result says, if CHSH probability is one, then communication complexity of arbitrary function is just one. That means if Alice has n bits and Bob has n bits and they want to compute f x y, Alice has n bits x, Bob has n bits y, and they know common function f, that is function from two n bits to one bit, and they want to compute f x y. And how many bits they have to communicate? It is communication complexity. Usually communication complexity is large. As, as n grows, communication complexity grows in both, both in classical physics and quantum physics. But if CHSH probability is equal to one for any n, communication complexity is just one. <coughs> Only R has to send one bit to Bob. Then Bob can compute any function. So this is implausible. So if we regard this as postulate to nature, so because we don't, do not believe such super efficient communication is not allowed by nature, then we can rule out this theory. Uh, next uh, result is improvement of this. CHSH probability is if greater than 0 0.908, then C communication complexity is one bit again. Small error is allowed, constant error is allowed in this setting. But still, there is a gap between quantum limit. Uh, so all these communication complexities detect classical communication complexity, or, or are you allowing pre shared quantum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah in, in this case, Alice and Bob can use sh shared state in general theory, okay. and it has CHS probability greater than quantum limit. Oh, sorry, I'm referring to the quantum complexity as well. When you say like quantum complexity is an arbitrary function, is that like classical communication complexity? Like Alice and Bob just have X and Y, and we have no. Yeah, but, but they can use shared state. Some. Oh, so they can, oh, so they are like that shared. Yeah. Okay, yes. But there still exists gap between quantum limit. And the third result completely characterizes this quantum limit. They show that above this quantum limit, some new principle called information causality is violated. This intuitively means that Alice, Alice has two to n bits, and Bob wants to know one of two to n bits, and Alice doesn't know which, which bit Bob wants to know. Obviously, Alice has to send two to n bits. This is what information causality required. But above the quantum limit, Alice only, only has to send 1.992 to n bits. Then Bob can choose arbitrary one bit of two to n bits. So this is strange. So they explain this quantum uh, limit by using information causality. But I'm still interested in Brasser et al.'s result on communication complexity. And, and I wanted to improve this threshold to quantum limit, but I couldn't. And I showed that uh, this threshold cannot be improved by generalization of their technique. Okay. So, so it can be improved means there are models of computations for which there, are, uh, uh, say, you have zero point eighty nine, uh, and but you, but the communication complexity is not one always. Is that what you mean? I uh, here, yeah. So it is not obvious that communication complexity is one or not between these two thresholds. No, what do you mean by not cannot be improved? It means you know there is this model of computation which is neither quantum nor classical, uh, for which you know this probability would be like zero point eighty nine. Is that what you're saying? I mean, the situation is, basically the situation is classical, but they can use some black box, which, which is abstract device, I will uh, introduce it. Uh, but uh, it is abstract version of state, state, and it has larger CHSH probability than quantum limit, like 0 0.908. And I, I said Bob can use this black box. So in this setting, what is the communication complexity? This is the question. So, 
let me introduce this black box. It is called no local box. It is abstract device, which has two input ports and two output ports. If X and Y are given, this output A and B. And this behavior is specified by this conditional distribution. Of course, this must satisfy no signaling condition. And this uh, has the larger CHSS probability in general. So A plus B is equal to X and Y with some probability, which is larger than quantum limit in general. So in the following, we assume that this non-local box is isotropic. That means uh, <coughs> for any fixed X and Y, A plus B is equal to X and Y with some fixed probability. So in the previously, we assume that X, Y, and Y be obeys uniform distribution. But here, here, we assume that for any fixed X and Y, A plus B is equal to X and Y with P, C, H, S, H. So this doesn't lose generality by using simple trick. By using shared random bits, we can randomize input for a uh, non-local box. So without loss of generality, we can assume that a uh, non-local box is isotropic. So the so situation is almost same as classical case, but they can use this non-local box. This is a difference. So the situation is following. Let's consider extra game. Alice uh, is given n bits, and Bob is given n bits, and they answer A and B, and they win if and only if A plus B is equal to fxy. F is uh, arbitrary function. But they can use non-local box. What is the largest winning probability? And if this winning probability is large, then communication complexity is one, because it is sufficient to send this A to Bob. Then Bob can compute A plus B. This is equal to fxy with large probability. So first, first result is uh, if CHSH probability is one, exactly one, then winning probability of any XR gain is one. This is very easy. Any Boolean function can be represented by F2 polynomial. So this is a polynomial. And so we can assume that AIX and BIY are monominals. And they have a non-local box with CHSH probability one. Then they input AIX and BIY into ICE <coughs> non-local box. They can use unlimited number of non-local boxes. Then they get AI and BI, and their XOR is equal to AND of inputs. So they, then we obtain this. So if A is equal to this and B is equal to this, then their XOR is equal to F with probability one. So it's sufficient to send this to Bob. Then Bob can compute arbitrary function. So it's, proof is very easy, but, but so this would be the reason why the CHSH probability one is not allowed. So next, so we generalize this result to smaller CHSH, uh, CHSH probability. So f first, let me introduce one uh, notion of bias. Bias means if probability is greater than one half, bias means two p minus one. In other words, bias is quantity here. So quantity, this quantity is called bias. And if delta is bias of CHS probability, the three core corresponds to bias one half, and quantum limit two over square root two over four corresponds to bias one over square root two, and one corresponds to one. And if x is plus one minus one random variable, the bias of probability one is expectation, because it is one plus beta over two minus one minus beta over two. It is beta. Sorry, is delta the same as beta? Ah, yes, yes. I'm sorry. So delta is a special character only for CHS probabilities. So. <coughs> and if x and y are zero one independent random variables with bias delta x and delta y, then bias of x or is their product. Because if we consider they are plus one, minus one, the XOR corresponds to product, and bias is exp expectation. And expectation of product is product of expectation because they are independent. So we, we obtain this. Okay. 
the result is if CHSH probability is greater than 0 0.908, that cor corresponds to CHSH bias square root two thirds, then winning probability of any XOR game is constant, strictly greater than one half. So this means still one bit communication allows uh, computation of F with probability strictly greater than one half. So it is also implausible. So idea is following. First, we obtain very small bias by using very small protocol. In fact, this bias is very small, two to minus n. Then we amplify this bias to constant. This is a protocol. They use shared n bit random bits, r, and random bit, r prime. And a, a is f x r, and b is zero if y equal to r, and b is r prime otherwise. Then if y equal to r, then b is zero, and a is f x y, because y equal to r. In that case, a plus b is equal to f x one with probability one. For other cases, b is r prime. This is a uniform random bit. So this XOR is uniform random bit. So this equality holds with probability one half. So winning probability is one over square root two to n. This is, this is probability of y equal to r. In this case, winning probability is one. And for other case, winning probability is one half. So winning probability is slightly greater than one half. So this bias is very small, but slightly greater than one half. Then we amplify this bias. <coughs> the idea is majority three. This is a polynomial representation of majority three. Assume that both of inputs and outputs are plus one or minus one. Assume all, all inputs are plus one, then this is one plus one plus one minus one. This is two and divided by two, so this is one. And if Z1 and Z2 are one, and Z3 is minus one, then this is one plus one minus one plus one. So this is one. And for other cases, this is odd function. So if all inputs are flipped, output is flipped. So this is majority three. Then we assume that input is slightly biased. Bias is expectation. And we assume that expectation is epsilon, then output bias is expectation of out, uh, majority three, then it is simply inputs. All inputs are replaced by epsilon because all, are, all has expectation epsilon and, and they are independent. And then we obtain this output bias. So majority three amplify bias. This is trivial. Then, next we consider noisy majority three. What happens for noisy majority three? This y represents error. Y is equal to plus one if error does not occur, and y equal to minus one if error does occur. And assume that y has a bias low, expectation is low, then we obtain this output bias. Then. We, we obtain something like this. This curve corresponds to this, this function. Horizontal axis is epsilon. And this straight line corresponds to epsilon. This is just a straight line of slope one. Then we are interested in very small epsilon, very small bias. So we are interested in uh, slope at zero. Slope at zero of this function is low by three halves. And if this is greater than one, very small bias is amplified. So if we apply this noisy majority three recursively, so let's imagine the uh, ternary three of majority three, and all leaves ha has bias epsilon, then by this noisy majority three, uh, very small bias is iteratively amplified like this. and we can obtain bias uh, arbitrarily close to this fixed point. So it is constant. This is the idea. So the threshold for low is two thirds. If low uh, computation of majority three
succeeds with bias greater than two thirds, then bias is amplified. So the remaining problem is how Alice and Bob can compute majority three without communication. <coughs> this is a F2 polynomial representation of majority three. Uh, zero, zero, 001, and this product means and. Of if all of them are one, then all terms are one, so this is one, and if two of inputs are one, one term is one, so one, and for other cases, they, all of them are zeros. So this is majority three. And what they want to compute is this, majority three of A1 plus B1, A2 plus B2, and A3 plus B3. Here, A1, A2, a1, B1, A2, B2, and A3, B3 are obtained by the first simple protocol. And first, first simple protocol is repeated <coughs> three times independently. Then they obtain three pairs. But of course, A are owned by Alice and B are owned by Bob. And so they are not together, so they cannot compute A1 plus B1. But anyway, they try to compute this function. Compute means A compute, I compute A, and Bob compute B, such that A plus B is equal to this, with some probability. Then you obtain this expression of this function. And here, these A1, A2, A2, A3, and A3, A1 can be computed by Aris, Aris. And Bob can compute these three terms. But neither of Aris nor Bob can compute these two terms. So they use non-local box here. Alice input A1 plus A2, and Bob input B2 and B3. Then they get output alpha zero and beta zero. And their XOR is equal to AND of inputs with some probability. This E0 represents error. Then they obtain this, and this is Alice's uh, output, but intermediate output and this is Bob's intermediate output, then they get one pair with larger bias, sometimes larger bias. It depends on CHC's probability. Then we can repeat this method. An error is XOR of two errors, and each error has bias delta, so XOR of two error is square of delta. And our condition is delta square is at least two thirds. Then we obtain the threshold square root two thirds. This is a proof. So <coughs> let me summarize this protocol. First, we have this protocol. This is a very simple protocol. This protocol doesn't use non-local box. Uh, this protocol gives very small bias, two to minus n. Then we consider the ternary tree of majority three. Each leaf corresponds to these two to n, two to minus n biases. Then we apply this protocol for computing noisy majority three, and each step bias is slightly amplified by using this formula, because rho is greater than two thirds. Then at, at each step, this is uh, amplified, and finally we obtain constant bias. So this is a proof. Just to clarify, on the previous slide, Rho was the bias of the, of the ability to compute the majority of threes? That, that what I'm saying? And you're saying that if the bias of the non-local block is at least root two-thirds, then you can compute this with bias at least? Uh, yeah. If uh, the non-local box CHS's bias is greater than square root two-thirds, yeah, this, this law is greater than two-thirds. Yes. 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 So I think. So, so again, switch to the. Uh, yeah, so here alpha zero means A1, uh, XR, A2, right? Sorry? Here, so here alpha zero is A1, XR. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, because A1, it's already used here, so. So, idea is very simple. This part seems very tricky, but anyway, <laughs> e easy to understand. So, Natural question here is why majority three is used. We can consider any other functions. This is a very natural question. And for generalization, we have to generalize two quantity, two, which is number of non-local boxes, 
for the computation. <coughs> and second quantity is two thirds. This is a threshold for the Python amplification. This is inverse of slope at zero. And I showed that I, I generalized these two quantities to, to general function, and I showed the unique optimality of majority three. So unfortunately, we cannot improve the threshold. Majority three is the best for your function. Yes. So let's uh, move to the next topic. It is information causality. This is very interesting. Information co causality intuitively means that if Alice communicates m bits to Bob, then total information obtainable by Bob cannot be greater than m. This is written in the abstract of this <coughs> paper published in Nature. So formally, information causality is defined by using Shannon's mutual information, but I don't like the definition because the equation doesn't have operational meaning, probably, at least for me. So, but anyway, this result is significant. So what they showed essentially is following. If Alice has two ten bits, Bob wants to know one of Alice's two ten bits. Alice doesn't know which bit Bob wants to know. In this case, let's consider one-way communication from Alice to Bob. Information causality says that Alice has to send two ten bits. But above the quantum limit, Alice only has to send 1.992 bits. This is what they showed. This is a theorem, essentially they showed. So first, uh, we consider address function. This means Alice has two to n bits and Bob has n bits. This n bits represents index of Alice's bit and output is x, y. This y is integer represented by y i to y n. This is a binary representation. Then, what they showed is there is an adaptive protocol of the XOR game for the address function with bias delta to n. Proof is easy. Uh, proof is induction. First, we consider n equal to one. For n equal to one, Alice has two bits and Bob has one bit and this must be x, y1. So this is a po polynomial representation. If y1 is zero, second term is zero, so x0. And if y, y1 is one, this is one, so x0 plus x0 plus x1 is equal to x1. So this is ad address function. So we can use non-local box for the second term. This gives no adaptive, pro sorry, I, I didn't explain what is adaptive and no adaptive. No adaptive means uh, input of non-local box does not depend on output of another non-local box. Anyway, here there is a pro protocol with bias delta because we only need one non-local box here. Majority three needs two terms, but here only one term. So this is a proof for n equal to one. For induction step, induction step use recursive structure of address function. Address function can be represented in this way. Here, z0 and z1 are defined here. <coughs> yn is the most significant bits of y. So here, the most significant bits are zero. So this is first half. And th they are second half. Here, the most significant bit is, is assumed to be one. Then, appropriate one is chosen by using yn. So this is recursive structure of address function. Okay, then from the hypothesis of induction, we have a protocol for address function of n minus one. So we apply the protocol for them. We obtain a zero and b zero such that zero xor is equal to z zero with some probability. E zero represents error and same for z one. Then this is equal to a y one plus b y one plus e y one. Uh, so we obtain this. And B Y, sorry, B Y N. So, and B Y N, Bob can compute B Y N, and E Y N is error, this is just error, so this is not uh, something to try to compute. And this is 
for computation of this, we need non-local box and apply the protocol in the previous slide. We obtain A prime plus B prime plus error E prime. So this is a final output. A prime is a final output of Alice, and B prime plus BYN is final output of Bob. And error is XOR of two errors. E prime has biased delta because E prime comes from here, address one. So E prime has bias delta, and E y n has bias delta to n minus one. This is hypothesis of induction. So it has bias delta to n. So this is a proof. So okay, this is a theorem. X for computing address function, there is protocol with bias at least delta to n. I showed we showed this. So why this is significant? If I send one bit to Bob, after, after the protocol, if I send one bit to Bob, error probability is one minus delta to n over two, because bias is delta to n. So if the, this protocol is repeated in, independently m times, and I send all bits, m bits, then error probability is upper bounded by this. This is simple, very known result in information theory. This is called butter chair parameter, and yeah, same result is obtained by Cheryl Band. And here, substitute epsilon here, we obtain this upper bound of error probability. Uh, this means Alice sends all of m bits and a1 to am, and Bob compute a1 plus b1, a2 plus b2, and am plus bm, and then take majority of them. This is the best uh, strategy of m. It is for, uh, for Bob. It is maximum likelihood decoding. And this has uh, error probability at most this. And we obtain this upper bound. And f how large M should be for small error probability? M should be the inverse of this, at least inverse of this. So M should be larger than this, delta to minus 2n. It, 1 over square root 2 corresponds to quantum limit. And if delta is greater than quantum limit, then delta is upper bounded by two, strictly smaller than two. That means 1.99 to n is sufficient for small error probability. Yes, so this shows that if CHSH probability is greater than quantum limit, then 1.99 to n bits communication allows Bob to select arbitrary one bit from RC2 to n bits. Bob cannot choose two bits simultaneously, but Bob can choose arbitrary one bit after Alice sends 1.99 to n bits. So this, this means Bob change meaning of information in 1.99 to n bits after, after receiving bits. So this means uh, this protocol violates information causality. Okay, so probably this is a good timing for end, the end of talk. So thank you for your attention. Do we have any questions for the speaker? Uh, this uh, non-local box has the odd property that Presumably, it communicates no information. On the other hand, it's very useful right, for all, all these protocols. So from my naive point of view, there must be a way in which it really is communicating information of some form. Do uh, you have some intuitive idea or explanation uh, for that or way of thinking about it? Sorry, for non-local box? The non-local, yeah, PR, PR box, yeah. So ah. uh, it's supposed not to communicate information. I mean, this is, this is sort of no a cigarette. starting point, as I yes. understand it. Nonetheless, it's very useful. Yes. And therefore, in some sense, it must be communicating information in some way of thinking about it. So, so I'm asking, what is there this secret way of thinking about it? So. That, um, we, we should regard non-local box arrow communication, you mean. Uh, you, you mean, no, we, sh 
we, we thought non-local box does not allow communication because they satisfy no signaling, no, no signaling condition. Yes. But you means we should allow, uh, we should regard non-local box allow communication. Do you mean? Well, isn't it communicating something? I mean, here you have all these marvelous results if you get to use it enough times. So, um, <clears throat> so a world where you have it is different from a world where you do not have it. And what I'm asking is, can you give me some, you know, arm-waving explanation or intuition as to as to what it is really useful for? What is really doing? Or, or tell me that I'm silly in asking these questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a concrete version of this question. Can you show us the probability one uh, point from way back in the beginning? The, that's like the vertex of the yes, yes. non-signaling region? So, yeah, this, uh, no, one, one more. Um, yeah, this, uh, uh, no, this one. This one, yeah. So, this, this, so yeah, yeah, I guess, do you have some like intuitive explanation for this? or? <laughs> you can just stare at it for a couple minutes. I know. <laughs> no, but the idea is that this doesn't violate no signaling. So from yes. either Alice or Bob's perspective alone, it looks like no communication is yes. happening. Yes. But it's sort of secretly communicating anyway, or something like that. Yes. I know that's not exactly <laughs> yeah. yeah. So do you have an explanation? Mm, I'm sorry, I don't have explanation. <laughs> okay. Maybe we can just <laughs> yes. It's like a magical device. It's like shouldn't exist. So I mean, you're trying to, it's like saying, can you explain this fictional magical thing? No, it shouldn't exist. There's no reason unicorns should not exist. <coughs> just, just, just don't. I can if I, if I want to construct a box with, you know, experts in computer science who show me how, where, you know, I don't, I, I put, allow simply everything to be close together. And I put the inputs in, and I get the outputs according to this tape. Nothing wrong with that, right? I'm just ha having inputs are near nearby, and then and I get outputs, right? So then, so then I'm asking, you know, isn't there some sort of information flow which is permitted in that case when you when you build the box together? And this is a terribly naive question, so so you shouldn't take it as as being profound. So, so what this thing does is this, this basically, uh, I mean, you can think of this sort of non-local box as doing a sort of communication, and that it's sort of uh, basic, or it, it's basically correlating the results of A and B, like exactly. So um, if, Basically, in all of the cases where the output is supposed to be zero or supposed to be one, uh, the box uniformly chooses between the options that give that output. Um, uniformly between chooses between A and B. Um, so I guess you can think of this non-local box as secretly doing communication, but using quantum mechanics, wavy hands. This isn't quantum mechanics. I mean, that's that's the part of the whole business, right, is that PR boxes are not quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics puts limits which these things exceed. Uh, uh, so conclusion is, is it's not, is not quantum mechanical. So but I'm sort of asking for a simple mechanical explanation in which you're sort of putting things together. I mean, my, my impression is that this is advertised, as you know, uh, some sort of thing that's, that's no signaling, so, uh, so information is, is not propagating, but I have the feeling that it's like this old magician business, you know, you, you, you show <laughs> one thing and, <clears throat> and, and, and people believe it, but, but on the other hand, you're pulling the rabbit out of the hat someplace else. So I'm, I'm simply asking, isn't there a sort of naive explanation of this? Uh, I'm sorry. Let me ask a different question. Maybe you can sort of say that this, this no signaling criterion isn't enough to completely encapsulate communication. So this, this so the fact that the fact that we, you know, this in principle, this box, you know, you can just hardwire the outputs and that's and then you've done it. 
uh, it, it probably suggests that there's some deeper meaning to communication that this line of work is almost trying to get. You know, what is it about communication that prohibits something like this, which you know satisfies this natural criterion of the mm -hmm. of the you know, signaling, but maybe I guess the point is that there should be more, and you know we haven't quite okay, obtained so, so that. Okay, no, so no signaling is too weak a condition that's, to, that's, to rule yeah, out communication. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So I just feel like the no signaling condition, uh, it it just like says uh, that the, like the, the total probability under like all so for a uh, the total probability under like all um, outcomes of b uh, should sum up to be like say one half or like it shouldn't change uh, if like y changes right but yeah. in this case the total probability doesn't change what's changed is like. Um, like sort of the phase between A and B, so like uh, they're both one half, but uh, in the previous three cases they're like like zero at the same time or one at the same time, but in the last case it's like zero one or one zero. So yes. I feel like that's what's going on, and that's not like yeah. captured by the no signal. Yeah. So no signal condition is too weak to to prohibit the strange phenomenon. That's true. So so our we want to find this uh, new definition of uh, of no, stronger version of no, no signaling. So the information causality is one, one of the answer, I think. Mm. Well, in this file, it's information causality. Is what, what you're information causality uh, uh, completely <coughs> uh, characterizes quantum limit. Information causality completely characterizes this quantum limit of CHSH probability. So in this sense, uh, co co information causality is strong enough, f f at least at least in this setting. Okay. Well, so, so, thank you. Yes. So, um, what happens for the multi-party communication? So, is the are the limits remain the same? Do they change? Uh, I'm I'm sorry. I I don't know where on multi-party case. <coughs> so three parties instead of Alice and Bob. There's Alice, Bob, and Carol, and they're trying to compute some function. For it. Yeah, we, we can define no signaling and we can consider the same story here, but I'm not sure, so, okay. So, yeah, so situation is, so, um, one problem is CHSH game. Why we only look at CHSH probability? It is also a question. Maybe this is not answer for your question, but, so, for example, if the, uh, ternary case. In this case, all of x, y, a, and b are binary. But if x and y are ternary, still a and b are binary, there is there are non-trivial facets. Uh, uh, CHSH facet is not unique non-trivial facet. There are different type of non-trivial facets. So there is no reason why we only consider CHSH inequality. So so in this sense, so this analysis is not uh, easy to generalize, to characterize whole of this set, quantum set. So this is problem. And as I said, multi-party case is also problem. Yes. Um, I guess if there are any more questions, we can take them offline. So let's just thank our speaker one more time.